Welcome to the G3 Podcast. I'm excited to bring you this new season of our episodes. Glad to, that you're joining us. Wanted to uh, engage in a conversation, uh, I, th- I think an incredibly important conversation, to be sure, uh, about how to reform a church, how to reform a church. We've got a lot of church planners who are you know, heading to new places, but but also folks who are maybe getting hired for the first time at, a, at, a, at an established church. So there's a lot of things going mm-hmm. on, a lot of moving pieces and parts. And so would love to get you guys' feedback on this subject, and, and, and let's let's kind of talk about that. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, what does it mean to be a Reformed church is a, mm. it's a great question because you start looking at the life of the church and you start asking, well, does that mean just, you know, if, if a person or a pastor holds to the doctrines of grace, is that a Reformed church? Yeah. And I would say not really. I think that that would be a Reformed pastor or a at least Reformed in his soteriology mm-hmm. But what about worship? What about the, the, the totality of the church? Mm-hmm. And so how to, uh, again, is a really, really good question, because if you have a young pastor that comes into the life of a church, uh, he could come in there as a wrecking ball. Yeah. He could come in there as, you know, unchained, sort of like cage stage, regulative principle guy that's just like, well, you know, this church is all messed up and I'm here to fix it. Right. And so we're going to, you know, fix everything from, you know, the Arminianism that's in the church, the lack of reformed ecclesiology that's in the church, the the lack of reformed preaching and worship that's in the church. And we're going to do all of this within two months. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that's just a recipe for disaster. Right. And how many churches have experienced mm-hmm. overzealous, well-meaning pastors that were just literally just came through the church like a bull in a china shop. Mm-hmm. We just need to be very cautious about that. Yeah. So, yes, I think that the church should be consistently being reformed. So what does that mean? Obviously, the Reformation was a specific era within church history. We look back and we see that the Word of God had been perverted by the Roman Catholic Church, and the Reformers were coming and saying, you know what, the people need the Word of God in their own tongue, in their own language. So they would dedicate themselves, and they would risk their lives to make sure that the common man had the Bible and had access to the Bible in his own language. Mm -hmm. And it literally was an explosion that happened. We saw this with Luther there in Germany. You see it with Tyndale uh, in the English Reformation. And so God blessed that work. But the Reformation continues, and it's not just protesting against the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church and the false salvation that's being taught by the Church at Rome, but when we look at the culture today, the culture all around us is consistently deforming us. So when someone says, I'm Reformed, well, I want to know what that means, first of all, right? But when we think about reforming a church, it's not just making a church Calvinistic, Mm -hmm. It's not just making a church, you know, agree with the doctrines of grace. Uh, When we think about reforming a church, it's just, it's not making a church agree with John Calvin. Reforming a church means, in essence, just a real simple definition would, would mean that as we see the culture deforming God's people, we are bringing people back to his word. That's good. And so that's all it is. So, so we should be on a weekly basis striving to be reformed. The Reformation continues, yes, historically, a protest. We're Protestants. We're protesting against the Roman Catholic Church to this very day until such time that the Roman Catholic Church bows the knee to Christ and repents from the blasphemy that they teach. Mm -hmm. However, when we talk about reforming a church, we're talking about the ongoing process of just ordering the church, every aspect of the church, according to the Word. Yeah. Yeah, Man, that's absolutely. really good. That's really I think good. this is such an important question. It's one that we get all the time. I mean, pastors in our church network have asked this. Um, you know, even in, in the things that I do on worship, this is often asked, like, how fast should we move? How do we do this? Yeah. How do we implement? You know, maybe I teach a class or we do a biblical worship workshop. And uh, and people are like, man, you know, pastors are like, Man, we really get this. We see the biblical teaching. So how do we do this? And what I, I think is so important for us is to remember first and foremost what exactly we're trying to accomplish. I mean, ultimately, obviously, we're trying to glorify God, and we're trying to be biblical, okay? So that's a given. But why? what are we trying to do toward that end? 
And I think some of the some of the missteps that we sometimes make is we think, okay, there's this ideal reformed church, right. and if we can just get there, there right. then will be we've arrived. Right. And that is completely wrong way to think because a you're never going to arrive, right? You're never going to arrive at a perfect church because it's filled with sinners. You know, this side of heaven, no church is going to be perfect. No church is going to be completely, you know, completely aligned in every respect. But number two, as pastors, we have to remember what what our job is. Our job is not to get the people in our congregation and our church to be this idealist perfection. Right. We are shepherds. Our goal is to shepherd people, and like you said, Josh. Uh, continually bring them back to the Word, right. help them to understand the the need to conform themselves and to conform us as a church to the Word. Right. And so uh, so that means we're going to take it slow. Yeah. We're going to constantly emphasize what we're doing and, and not have this sort of idealized picture in our mind. If we start there, if we understand exactly what our goals are, I think that's going to solve a lot of problems. We're not going to have this, you know, change in two months perspective. Because and then the other problem is, as a pastor, we're, you're going to get very, very frustrated very quickly. Mm. I mean, because you might be able to change everything in two months, but you're probably going to lose most of your people, so that's frustrating. Or you're going to get resistance, or you know. So if we have the mentality, we want our people to be to be uh, sanctified by the Word of God, and we want our church to be reformed by the Word of God, but we have a pastoral goal, a shepherding goal. Right. That is going to help with avoiding a lot of dangerous problems. So, so if, I under, if I understand you correctly, what you're aiming toward is not the idea that someone comes in and starts uh, changing programs and changing music and changing all of these things, but that the idea is that that the, the pastor is going to co- is going to be consistent and and reforming the people and informing and shaping them through gospel proclamation through the preaching of the, of the word of god and seeing hearts transformed and changed that way when the changes do come in in programmatic ways the, the, everyone's with you yeah. you're taking them along along with you yeah. uh, talk to us Josh a little bit about like wh- how long does does that process take is that is that a you know wh- wh- when do we push back what does that look like how how, do, how does someone figure that piece out yeah i think it depends every church is different right mm-hmm. and, 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 and yeah, every culture you know, church culture is going to be different mm-hmm. so you know if you're in say a, a very liberal context like say you know uh, uh, you know some sort of liberal you know, city that's, you know, you have a church that's been around, you know, a hundred years or so, and it's just been infiltrated by a lot of really bad theology. Mm-hmm. It might take you longer than a church that's been more conservative mm-hmm. in terms of at least holding to, you know, faithful biblical theology. Right. But I mean, if you think about the job of a pastor when he comes into the life of a church, he has to really assess things. So, for instance, you go into uh, an emergency room on a Friday evening and you're sitting there for an hour and you just watch how things work. Some people will come into that emergency room and check in and sit down and it will be hours before they make it to a nurse (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then eventually a doctor. Uh, Whereas other people will come in and within five minutes they're already back there. Why? Because there is a process of evaluating what is most urgent and the same thing happens in the life of a church. You know, you go into the life of a church and, you know, the church might have, you know, really bad Christmas decorations that you think are just really influenced too much by the culture. Should you say no more Christmas decorations or maybe there's something that's really more important than that? Right. And that might be some sort of view of, you know, uh, an incorrect view of women teaching and preaching in the life of the church, for instance, that's been held for for many years. So you're going to have to work patiently and cautiously and then try your best to bring people to make decisions according to the Word, not according to your own opinion. And that's really the key because the Word of God is our authority. Mm -hmm. So, I went away from Praise Mill Baptist Church, uh, went to seminary. I was out of state for about seven years, pastoring out of state, attending seminary. I came back into the context of this church, and when I was interviewed, I told them that while I was away, I, I held to a position and, and, and became convinced, according to God's Word, that the church should be led by a plurality of elders. Mm-hmm. In other words, this church was a conservative church, and had strong leadership historically, 
but the church had never in the history of the church held to a plurality of elders. So in the interview process, up front, I told them, yes, the the young man that grew up in the life of the church is a candidate to come back as pastor, but what you need to know is that if you call me, this is the direction that we will be going. Now, what I did not do uh, once they voted me to come as pastor was to come in and say, in three weeks, we're going to rewrite the Constitution and bylaws, and we're going to ordain four deacon, or four elders that can serve as a plurality of elders to balance off the deacons, the plurality of deacons that are serving, and say, now, I've, I've, I've you know, accomplished that goal. It would take four years wow. here to patiently teach and preach and, and help the people to see. And when I would work through passages of Scripture, if I'm preaching expositionally, and, and it said, you know, let the elders of the church singular, so elders plural, church singular. I would just note that to the people, and I would, I would, I would just emphasize yeah, that morality. teaching. Sure. And then eventually I taught a 10-week class on Sunday evenings on that very subject to the deacons. Mm-hmm. And the deacons became convinced that that was exactly what the Bible taught. Right. And then I would eventually preach... Uh, a series on ecclesiology on on Sunday evenings, and then eventually the church was convinced. Well, if this is what the Bible teaches, then why are we not doing this? <laughs> right. And then, of course, you just accomplish goals because yeah. that's what the Bible teaches. I mean, there's, there's some real maturity in thinking through that process, having a having a, a systematic approach, if you will, to how to get there. And really, it's just it's just Bible. It's just teaching people the Word of God, opening up God's Word. It's the way in which. We've uh, learned the way in which um, you know we've we formed these new ideas, and uh, as as we uh, as we approach church and uh, church life, I, I'm th- I'm wondering though, what do you say to the young man uh, who is you know maybe fresh out of out of seminary? He's you know filled with kind of the the energy to to go and make a difference and. I, it, it, who says, Josh, this sounds really good. I mean, it really does. And, you know, y- you probably need it four years. You know, he's not that guy. <laughs> but he's sharp. He's, you know, he's, he's razor sharp. He's ready to go. Um, it'll, it'll take him 12 months. It'll take him a year and a half. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's on the good side. How do you, how do you, what do you say to the pastor who's, who's feeling that, even though he hears everything that you're saying, uh, what, do you, what do you say to that person? Well, I think it might not take four years, but it takes the wisdom to assess, right? And every and church is I, different. Every every church is different, and the, the more times you can get the people to actually say the kinds of things that Josh, you were talking about, like, well, why aren't we doing this? The right. more times you can make that happen, yeah. the better it is going to be for the health. So it might not take as long, but you have to lead in such a way with careful teaching, careful preaching. It depends on how ingrained some of the traditions are in the church. Um, it depends on a whole lot of factors, but um, but still, you know, te- patient teaching rather than just fiat decisions yeah. is is going to have to be the way. I mean, there, there's 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 going to be some things when you assess and triage the situation that are so serious that there might have to be a fiat decision. Mm-hmm. But you want to make those as few and as rare as possible when when you can, as much as possible, patient teaching. And I think the other thing, we need to learn to differentiate the difference between a symptom and a fundamental issue. So Christmas decorations is probably a symptom of some other things that you can deal with more biblically rather than just saying, oh, with the Christmas decorations, right? There's so many things like that, um, even with regard to worship, that really are, you know, music, instrumentation, the things that are being sung, a lot of those are symptoms of more fundamental things that you can teach and preach on. And then, again, over time, those kinds of changes with the, on the symptomatic level are going to be much more organic and, and easier to do. Right. Yeah, that's good stuff. It, Josh, as we've talked, you know, coming here, uh, moving, me moving from, from Omaha, Nebraska, here to Praise Mill, um, and there's some adjustments. You know, I was at a traditional SBC. The music was different. A lot of different things happening, and and for for me, the transition was was one. It took a little time to process, but at the same time, I, I was ready to embrace everything that was happening. How do you how, how does a pastor navigate with maybe someone who's who's just you know died in the wool? They 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 don't want the change. They're not having it. They're they're gonna kind of push back against that. What would you say to to that person who's dealing with that kind of an issue? Yeah, I mean, obviously, any time in pastoral ministry where you come in to lead a church, if you are gonna lead the church, 
then you, you're you going to run into people at some level yeah. that are going to just dig their hills in yeah. and they're just, this is the hill that they're going to die yes. on, right? Yes. And I think as a pastor, I think what Scott said earlier was that, you know, we have to be patient. We have to be shepherds. We have to to care for the flock and, and to exercise wisdom on, on these issues. Mm-hmm. I just think that dealing with people with a patient, you know, long-suffering approach and a, and a genuine shepherd's heart yeah. will go a long way. Sure. It might not result in them staying in the right. church. Right. They right. might actually leave. Yeah. And I think when a pastor is leading according to God's Word and he says, you know, and again, hopefully, you know, with a plurality of pastors right. Right. leading the church, then obviously at some level— you know, the church is going to respond well to the Word of God if the church has been taught. And this, again, in the process of reforming a church, if you if you start with the doctrine of Scripture yeah. and you teach the people that this is the, the authority, not me, not some, you know, personality, because oftentimes when a pastor comes into the life of the church, he's dealing with early on when he sees the church and he says, okay, this is the direction that we want to go. Um, he's dealing with those very issues that you just now yeah, talked about yeah. because they're saying, well, really, Pastor Jim, who was before you, is really my pastor. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's really his positions that right. I hold to, not yours. Right. But if you come in as a patient soul and you labor with the people and you teach them that the Bible is our authority, mm-hmm. then ultimately, you know, if someone's going to disagree with a, a decision that you're making on 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 chapter and verse— mm-hmm they will be forced to actually disagree with the Bible, not with your opinion. Right, right. And that's the critical issue. Yeah, yeah. I want to put an excl- exclamation point on that because that is so so critically important. We often get asked in this kind of conversation, what's the first thing to change? What's the first thing to do? And the consistently that's run through all of our discussions such far is the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. Mm-hmm. You have to start there. That is the fundamental issue. That's the first thing to change. Mm-hmm. If, if, if you're worried about things in worship, start with more Scripture. Right. If you want to get a plurality of elders or, or whatever theological issue or practical issue, if the Christmas decorations are bad, start with Scripture. Start with biblical, biblical authority. If you give the people in your congregation a love for the Word of God, then they'll be easily convinced when you show them chapter and verse for these other things. And it's also going to separate the wolves from the true sheep, because if you make that your primary issue— you're going to start to see these people are actually resisting the word, yes. right? And so you, those people might need to be weeded out, or hopefully come to faith. Yes. Hopefully come to submission to the word. Yes. You've got to start with that. That is the fundamental issue, no matter what other practical issue or even theological issue we're talking about. The yeah. sufficiency and authority of the word Man. is number one. Man, that's good. And there's so many thoughts that, that I have around this as I listen to you guys kind of walk through some things for young pastors who are who are dealing with people and and uh, their their you know their past, their history, their their thoughts about how church should run, all of that. It's it's a lot for someone to to manage. And handle, and, and they're going to be struggling and, and dealing with you know feelings and issues at you know, late at night. That conversations that they take home with them and think through, and then get up in the morning, and then they've got to go back in, 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 in into the church. I mean, any any final words of advice, wisdom that you would share with uh, with someone who's walking through this? Yeah, I think just being very careful to not be like overzealous in your approach. Like the you, you know we talk about cage stage Calvinists, but you know there's a cage stage regulative principle person yeah. too that comes into the life of a church and they just want to say everything has to be in order and it has to you know we have six months to do this. Right. Uh, again, back to the whole plurality of elders conversation early on here. I remember there was a deacon that was at the church at that time. And he was very much, you know, in favor of of the direction that I was leading the church in that regard. He was a younger guy, and he came to the office one day, and he, you know, went out to lunch with me and one of the other uh, staff members, and we were having lunch, and 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 he said, "Look, we're all with you on this issue, so why don't you just do it like next week?" Wow. And I said, "Because I'm not planning to like." move to a different church in six months or two years. I'm planning on being here for a very long time. Yeah. And so I'm just going to be patient and gain the people's trust as I systematically unpack this issue. And I think that that's critically important. Again, there might be an issue in the life of the church that you see as a glaring contradiction that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. And and that may be the case, right? But it may be something that you could do over the course of a year or more. 
but in in one case, you know, I was pastoring a church in in Kentucky when I was in seminary. The church had never ever practiced biblical church discipline, mm. and there was a case of a of a deacon that was engaged in sin and and had to be confronted. And so we went through the process of you know private confrontation confrontation with witnesses. We just walked through the biblical process of Matthew chapter 18, and he resisted at every stage to the point that here I am as a young pastor. I had been there 18 months, Mm -hmm. and the previous pastor had been there 25 years. And, And so I ended up leading that church to vote this deacon out of the church to be excommunicated. Wow. And they and and literally the night that we excommunicated this deacon, um, the church was sobbing, mm-hmm. weeping, mm-hmm. F- as this man was being excommunicated. Mm-hmm. But the the vote was one hundred percent zero in opposition to the recommendation. Wow! And by God's grace, he would eventually repent, and he would be restored in the life of the church, wow. and he would. The day that I was leaving, when I had announced my resignation and I was going to be leaving to go pastor um, elsewhere, he he came to me and he said, um, "Pastor, I just want you to know that you're the 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 best pastor that this church has ever had." Wow! I knew that he wasn't telling the truth <laughs> uh, because I'd only been there just a few years, and it was the first church I ever pastored, and mm. I was very very new in pastoral ministry. Mm. But in that man's life, yeah. what he knew was yeah. that I did the unpopular thing. Yeah. But you see, that was a situation that necessitated something to happen fast mm-hmm. because there was sin that was right. very obvious. Mm-hmm. That wasn't something that we could sit back and just wait for like two years. Right. You, know, you might come into a church and you say, well, I see every single children's book that we, you know, we have back there has you know this picture of Jesus in it. That's my uncle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be for a G3 plus conversation. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, do, do you have to come in and say on the second week as pastor that this is a second commandment violation issue and we're going to just throw all of those books in the garbage, all those children's Bibles in the dumpster? Is is that really wise or should you maybe like tap the brakes and be be careful? And I just think that we need to exercise wisdom. So again, back to the core of this conversation, how do you reform a church? Mm-hmm. Well, you do so according to God's Word. Yeah. What is a reformed church? A reformed church is just a church that's ordered according to God's Word. And how do you reach those goals? Well, you you really just put at the forefront of your ministry and the foundation of your ministry the sufficiency and the authority of God's Word. Yeah. Yeah, and then patiently walk all of that out. Well, gentlemen, it's been great to have this conversation. I'm prayerful. I'm hopeful. In fact, I know you're going to be blessed by it. You're going to be edified by it. Uh, looking forward to you liking, sharing, subscribing uh, to us here uh, in this platform and any other platform that you that you are, are able to access G3, particularly with G3 Plus. You can go to G, you can go to plus g3 men org and subscribe. Thanks for joining us for this edition of G3 Podcast.